Now let's look at some of the complications that can occur during any cannulation, dialysis, and even after dialysis. Bleeding can occur during and after dialysis. During dialysis, blood may ooze out around the needle because the cannulation hole was enlarged during needle insertion, or blood may infiltrate the fistula because the vessel wall was penetrated during cannulation. Such bleeding under the skin is known as infiltration and may leave hematomas that can compromise the life and blood flow of the fistula. Bleeding can occur after dialysis when the needles are removed. This may be the result of the needle puncturing the vessel wall as it is withdrawn, applying too much pressure at the puncture site, which damages the vessel, or not applying enough pressure to achieve hemostasis. Pressure must be applied to both the cannulation site on the skin and into the fistula vein. Inadequate hemostasis may cause bleeding to recur as soon as the patient moves around or uses their access extremity, for example, while leaving the dialysis station. Prolonged bleeding after needle removal may indicate an increased intra-access pressure due to stenosis or a clotting disorder. So evaluate bleeding after 20 minutes. Notify the nephrologists of such episodes. Educate patients about post-treatment hemostasis and what to do at home if the needle site bleeds. This large hematoma is the result of an infiltration. It will take several weeks for the blood to be reabsorbed. In the meantime, you cannot use this access. The best strategy is to prevent infiltrations. Here's Deborah Brower with some advice on how to do just that. To prevent infiltrations when you cannulate, do not flip needles. Be careful when taping needles not to lift up on the needle once it is in the vein. An improper needle flip or taping procedure can cause trauma to the fistula wall, which in turn can cause an infiltration. Also check for flashback and aspirate with normal saline solution to ensure the needle flushes with ease and that there are no signs or symptoms of infiltration. Saline is less dense than blood, causes much less discomfort and damage to the tissue than blood if an infiltration does occur. To prevent post-dialysis infiltrations, use the proper needle removal technique as previously discussed. Apply a gauze over the site without pressure. Remove the needle at the same angle at which you inserted it. When the needle has been completely removed, apply firm but not excessive pressure with two fingers. One finger over the hole in the skin and one finger over the hole in the blood vessel. Maintain the pressure for 10 to 12 minutes to achieve hemostasis at both the skin and vessel holes and do not peek. If there is an infiltration, elevate the access extremity above the level of the heart. While protecting the skin over the access area with a clean cloth, gently apply ice for 20 minutes on and 20 minutes off during the first 24 hours. After that, apply a warm compress. If the fistula infiltrates, the Kadoki guidelines recommend letting it rest until the swelling is resolved. If the fistula infiltrates a second time, this may be a sign of non-maturation. Notify the access team, including the surgeon, as soon as possible for intervention. If you continue to cannulate and infiltrate the fistula, you could permanently ruin it. Don't use that fistula until you receive further directions. Supply your dialysis patients with a fistula bleeding emergency kit to use at home. The kit should contain gauze pads to apply to the bleeding site, tape to apply once the bleeding has stopped, and a card containing information that you will need if the bleeding does not stop and they require assistance. This card should list the vascular access type, and location and the name and number of the vascular access surgeon and the address of the hospital closest. Another problem you may encounter is poor blood flow through the fistula, which may be due to the location or position of the arterial needle. Change the direction of the needle at the next session.
If poor flow persists despite changing needle locations, contact the patient's nephrologists for referral of patient to a surgeon or an interventionalist for evaluation and possible treatment options. A tourniquet can cause poor blood flow if you leave it on during dialysis. Use a tourniquet for cannulation only. This is an aneurysm, which is a problem that can occur or be aggravated by frequent cannulations in the same area. By cannulating the same general area, the entire area becomes weakened and the vessel balloons out. An aneurysm may also be caused by stenosis. The narrowing of the vessel increases back pressure behind the stenosis, which causes vessel distension and weakening of the vessel wall. The most common problem you will encounter is stenosis, or narrowing of the vessel. Stenosis has several causes. It may be the result of previous injury to the vessel wall from intravenous and central venous catheters. When the surgeon creates the fistula, swinging the vein to the artery, the vessel can be traumatized, leading to stenosis. Aneurysm formation can also cause stenosis. Blood detouring through the aneurysm slows down and the vessel narrows. Repeated needle sticks or cannulations in the same area causes the smooth vessel wall to thicken up, leading to narrowing or stenosis of the vessel. Stenosis can form in any part of a fistula. There are four types of stenoses that affect fistulas. Inflow or juxta anastomotic, mid-access, outflow, and central vessel stenosis. The most common is inflow, or juxta-anastomotic stenosis, which prevents the fistula from maturing and makes cannulation impossible. Outflow stenoses typically occur with much more frequency in arteriovenous grafts than with fistulas. Stenosis of central veins can occur in the large vessels in the shoulder, neck, and chest, and between the axis and the heart. Here you see distended, obstructed left shoulder veins that indicate central vein stenosis. You can also see collateral circulation that has developed. Linda, what are some of the signs that a stenosis has developed? There are a number of clues that a stenosis is present. For example, a stenosis could cause clotting and backups in the extracorporeal circuit two or more times in a month. If this occurs, you need to ask some pertinent questions about clotting. For example, whether there has been a change in anticoagulant medications or if the patient has had a transfusion, thereby excluding or including causes of stenosis other than thrombosis. There are a number of other clues that there is stenosis. These include persistently swollen access extremity, changes in the brewery or thrill, difficulty in placing or advancing the needle, blood squirting out during cannulation, elevated venous pressures or excessively negative pre-pump arterial pressure, both of which cause frequent alarms, decreased blood pump speeds, inability to achieve blood flow rate, changes in the patient's dialysis adequacy results, known as KT over V, or changes in the urea reduction ratio, recirculation, prolonged post-dialysis bleeding times, and frequent episodes of access thrombosis. Seeing any combination of these clues should prompt you to do recirculation studies to verify the presence of stenosis. Always observe the access extremity for evidence of stenosis when you do the physical examination of the fistula. Use the technique we discussed previously in which you have the patient hold the access arm down and make a fist to distend the vein. Then have the patient raise the arm up in the air while keeping the fist clenched. You should see the vein collapse if there is no stenosis. If there is stenosis within the fistula, part will be engorged and part will be flat. If it is a central vein stenosis, the entire fistula will stay engorged. But what about clots? How do they relate to stenosis? I'd like to tackle that if I may. Fistulas may form clots, although much less often than in grafts, as stenosis is much less common in fistulas. 
A thrombosis in a new fistula is usually attributed to surgical and or technical problems or premature use. A thrombosis in a mature fistula may be due to poor blood flow, whether from cardiac problems or arterial stenosis, hypotension, either from dehydration, sepsis, medications, or dialysis, hypocoagulation, and patients inadvertently compressing the fistula while sleeping. An including thrombosis can form a layer of bacterial growth and infection. The cannulation site may also become infected. That's right, but fistulas have the lowest risk of infection of any vascular access type. However, each pre- and post-dialysis exam should include checking for changes in the skin over the access that indicate infection. Signs and symptoms of infection include redness, increase in body or skin temperature, elevated white cell count, swelling, hardness, drainage from the incision or needle sites, tenderness, and pain. Patient complaints of malaise and or fever may be clues to infection in association with these other signs and symptoms. Proper needle site preparation by both patient and staff reduces risks of infection. The best way to prevent an infection is to follow your unit-specific infection control policy and procedures. Before we wrap this up, we need to address Steele syndrome. Steele syndrome is the result of inadequate blood supply to the tissues of the hand, which results in a reduction of oxygen called ischemia. It is caused by the fistula stealing blood away from the extremity distal to the fistula. Signs of Steele syndrome include nail bed discoloration, a cool hand, and a weak or absent pulse. Steele syndrome can lead to severe pain and to serious neurological and soft tissue damage that can cause limitations in mobility, for example, in grip strength and dexterity, loss of function, ulcerations, and tissue necrosis, gangrene. Here's an example of a patient with severe Steele syndrome who has developed the typical ischemic contractures known as claw hand. Surgical procedures such as the distal revascularization interval ligation or drill can successfully treat Steele and ischemia. I think we covered all the learning objectives we set out to cover. Indeed we have. We trust that this educational program has helped you to understand the importance of AVF. Upgrade your knowledge of cannulation techniques, troubleshoot problems, and communicate effectively with other members of the patient care team. A native arteriovenous fistula for chronic hemodialysis optimizes the quality of care for your hemodialysis patients. Understanding the importance of properly caring for new and mature fistulas is the first step most logical step towards consistently delivering high-quality care to all of your patients. In the final analysis, it is the skill of your cannulation technique and your ability to care for the fistula that help ensure the longevity of the dialysis access. That, in turn, leads to better outcomes for the patient. And better outcomes for the patient is, as always, our ultimate goal. For further information on cannulation and other AVF issues, please visit the official Fistula First website at www.fistulafirst.org.